Hello and welcome. Here I will be going through the Chemistry Foundation paper from June 2013. Um, please make sure you have a, a calculator. You will need one for this exam as you will for every science exam really. Um, it does suggest you have a ruler and it does give you uh, the chemistry data sheet which I will show you. So here's the chemistry data sheet which you get given at the beginning of the exam. It gives you the reactivity series of metals, the non-metal doing italics, that might help with a couple of questions, some common formula of the ions that you might be looking at, and the second part, of course, is the periodic table. Okay, and that would be quite useful for a lot of the questions. So straight into question one, and it tells us that magnesium burns in oxygen. I'm sure you've seen this many times during your school life. Question 1A, using the chemistry data sheet that we just looked at to help you to answer this question. The word equation for magnesium burning is magnesium plus oxygen gives you magnesium oxide. And it says draw one line from each substance to its correct description. Okay, remember in there, if you did draw more than one line from each of these substances, you would not get that mark. So whether or not you would actually need the, the data sheet for this, the periodic table, I'm not sure, but um, Magnesium, of course, is a metal. Magnesium oxide, so you've got two elements joined together, so that's going to be a compound. And oxygen is the only non-metal there, okay? There's no mixture. Part B, um, this diagram represents a magnesium atom, okay? So we've got the protons and neutrons in the middle there in the nucleus, electrons whizzing around the outside and it's asking you to complete this table. So what is the charge of a neutron? That's a charge of zero, okay? And which particle has a charge of minus one? Um, what we're looking for there is the electron. One part C, as it says there, use the chemistry data sheet to help you to answer these questions. You may or may not need it. Um, that's entirely up to you, really. Uh, drawing around the correct answer to complete each sentence. In a magnesium atom, the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Okay, so we already mentioned that. The number of protons in a magnesium atom is the atomic number. And the sum of protons and neutrons in a magnesium atom is the mass number. Okay, because you would add those two up. Okay, for question two, barbecues are heated by burning charcoal or burning hydrocarbons. Use the chemistry data sheet to help you answer this question. The chemical equation for charcoal burning is C plus O2 gives you CO2. Complete the word equation. So what they're asking you, basically, is what does the symbol O2 represent on the periodic table? So you could refer to the, the data sheet for that. Um, just find O as a symbol on the periodic table there and you would see that it represents oxygen. Propane is a hydrocarbon. Complete the displayed structure of propane. Draw in the missing bonds. So, no silly mistakes here. Um, we're going to have a single bond going from carbon to carbon and again and then from each carbon to hydrogen. One two, three, four, five. And that's what that structure would look like with the bonds filled in. Its formula, it's uh, a hydrocarbon, so it'd be C and H. How many carbons? One, two, three. So you put the subscript for that. How many hydrogens? One, two, three, six, seven, eight. And that would be the formula there. Okay, 2B part three. Draw a ring around the correct answer to complete the sentence. Propane burns in air to produce carbon dioxide and something. I'm sure you've done this experiment because we know that that's water. Two part C. We've got the table showing information about six different hydrocarbons. So we have the name and the formula. We have its state at room temperature where room temperature is 20 degrees. And we have its boiling point in degrees Celsius as well. So, using the data in that table, tick two correct statements about the six hydrocarbons. 
So ethane and butane boil at temperatures less than 20 degrees. So here's ethane, here's butane, and you can see this one boils at minus one, this one boils at minus 89. So that one's correct. Statement. Hexene and butene are alkanes. Well, because it ends in ene, both of these, then they're described as alkenes as opposed to alkanes. So we know that's not quite the case. The third statement, butane and hexane are liquid at zero degrees. So where's my butane? There it is. Um, and we can see now it's going to be a gas. And hexane is a liquid at room temperature, which might fit. Um, but you can see the butane being a gas at zero degrees obviously excludes that statement. So we're pretty confident now that this final statement should be true. Ethene and hexene each have a carbon to carbon double bond. So using ethene because that's the easy one, C2H4. So that formula drawn out. And don't ever be scared to just sketch this in. Okay, one, two, three, four. So each carbon there has got two bonds. They need four. That wouldn't be good enough because now you've got three. So can you see that ethene is going to have a, a double bond? It'd be the same for hexene. If it ends in ene, you know it has a double bond. So it's going to be that one there. Question three. Carbon dioxide is produced when metal carbonates are heated. Draw a, a ring around the correct answer to complete the word equation. So there's lots of these drawing rings in this exam this year. So it's uh, making things a lot easier. Uh, magnesium carbonate forms either magnesium, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, or magnesium oxide plus carbon dioxide. Again, this would be a, an experiment I'm sure you've done, and the answer it's going to form magnesium oxide. Okay. 3A part 2. Draw a ring around the correct answer to complete the sentence. The reaction to produce carbon dioxide from magnesium carbonate is known as what? And again, I'm sure you've gone over this. This is thermal decomposition. Okay. Three part B. A student investigated what happens when metal carbonates are heated. So we've got a Bunsen burner, metal carbonate, delivery tube going into lime water. Already I'm thinking lime water turning cloudy or milky when carbon dioxide is bubbled through it. So let's see what the student did. They used the apparatus to investigate heating four different metal carbonates. They started the stop clock at the same time as he began to heat the metal carbonate and stopped the stop clock when carbon dioxide was produced. Okay. The student's results are shown in the table. So this is the time taken for carbon dioxide to, uh, to be discovered in the lime water in seconds. So calcium carbonate, copper carbonate, magnesium carbonate, and zinc carbonate. So this is the fastest. Okay, just looking in my head now, and this one is the slowest. Okay, just sort of putting those um, into that form. Tick the type of graph the students should draw from these results. Because these results are categoric, i.e. we would draw a graph with the type of metal carbonate along the bottom, so you would have a different bar for each of the four chemicals that we looked at okay so that is a bar chart okay that would be the most appropriate graph to use b part two use the chemistry data sheet to help you answer this question draw a ring around the correct answer to complete the sentence the more reactive the metal in the carbonate the something time is taken for the production of carbon dioxide to start and what we found in class practicals and from our own reading is that the most reactive metals uh, take the most time or more time to produce carbon dioxide. 3b part 3 how did the student know that carbon dioxide was produced? Use the diagram of the apparatus to help you to answer this question. Well, I guess we've already answered this when we looked at the experiment on the previous page but what we're looking for is the fact that uh, lime water turns cloudy or milky when carbon 
carbon dioxide is bubbled through it. Okay, so one mark for lime water and one mark for saying that it is cloudy or milky. Four. Some fruits, seeds and nuts are sources of vegetable oils. The table gives some information about the three types. So we have corn, oil and rapeseed oil. And it tells you how much saturated fat, unsaturated fat, its melting point and the, its smoke point. Okay, the smoke point is the temperature range at which the oil begins to produce smoke when heated. Okay, and it's always a good idea at every question. Just read through the information they give you before you dive into whatever the question is. Okay, so for part A, use the information from the table above to answer these questions. Tick one correct reason why a vegetable has a has a range for the melting point. Okay, so our options, a vegetable has a high percentage of unsaturated fat. A vegetable has a range for the smoke point and a vegetable has a mixture of fats. Okay, I'm hoping you could see that the reason why you get a, a big range is because it's actually made up of a, of a mixture of fats. If it, you know, if there is a high percentage of unsaturated fat, even though it's high, it's it's going to be the same. So you wouldn't expect the, the melting point to be that different all of the time. But the fact that it's made up of a mixture of fats would mean that there's going to be a range. A part two complete this sentence the type of vegetable with the largest temperature range of smoke point is so that's uh, good enough to move the page there so which one has the biggest range would so be 268 take away 229 210 take away 204 and 240 take away 230 whether or not you need a calculator for that is entirely up to you but um, 229 so if I took it to 230 that would be 38 that'd be 39 this one be six, this one be 10. So obviously it's the first column. So that's corn oil. Four B, bromine water was added drop by drop to five centimeters cubed of each type of vegetable oil. Draw a ring around the correct answer to complete the sentence. The colour of the first drop of bromine water changes from orange to colourless. And again, I'm sure that's an experiment we've done or seen during lessons. And that's because bromine um, turns colourless in the presence of uh, double bonds. So if we've got any double bonds, it goes colourless. 4B2, which type of vegetable will react? With the most drops of bromine water well as we already said bromine water turns colorless in the presence of carbon to carbon double bonds okay so what they're asking you is which type of fat has the most double bonds or therefore the most unsaturated fat so looking back at the previous page um, we're looking at unsaturated fat and we could see there that uh, rapeseed oil with 88.6 is a higher percentage than the others okay so my first answer would be rapeseed oil and that's because it contains most unsaturated fat Question four, part C. Potato slices can be boiled in water or fried in olive oil. Okay, and there's a diagram just showing you that. Olive oil starts to produce smoke when heated to 204 degrees. Okay, the smoke contains carbon particles. Suggest what happens to molecules in olive oil to produce carbon particles. All we're gonna say here is that the olive oil molecules simply break down or you could say decompose now the mark scheme would allow 
for you to say that they that they would burn okay but if you said that they react then we're told to ignore that there's not enough information there you're not actually saying what's what, what's happening there okay so this would be a best answer the olive oil molecules break down or decompose 4c part 2 potato slices boiled in water will be different from potato slices fried in olive oil describe two differences okay so that's in bold for reason don't give one reason there's two marks up for grabs here some really obvious answers here you, you could say they're likely to taste different uh, they're likely to have a different color okay so I mean there's, there's really obvious stuff and I do keep saying state the obvious which is all about you could say different texture or different energy content okay any two from those great nice little question there okay question five <coughs> the diagram shows a ballpoint pen so we have a polypropylene cap and stopper a polyethene tube for the ink in the middle and polystyrene clear outer case with a nickel alloy con cone and a stainless steel ball at the very tip to write with okay so clearly we're going to get a question about materials here five part a polymers are used to make the ballpoint pen name the monomer used to make polyethene so the monomer of polyethene is ethene 5a part 2 draw one line from the monomer propene to its polymer polypropene so the in the polymer the monomer should be unchanged okay so what you're looking for is that same structure um, just with the n next to it and hopefully you'd see that it's going to be this one okay okay 5b two alloys are used to make the ballpoint pen so we have a nickel alloy and we have the percentage of the various metals that make it up and we have stainless steel the same there okay so looking at the keys use this bar chart to answer these questions which metal is in both of these alloys so first of all which which color is in both you can see it's this dark color and I looked at my key there and I could see that that's nickel okay so I just need to write nickel in there what is the percentage of iron in the stainless steel so look into my graph first of all I find iron you can see it's the diagonal lines there so it's this one to my stainless steel so what I've got to do and I would use my ruler here this is probably why I suggest you use a ruler I've got to draw across whoops that's why we want a ruler and you can see that's coming out there at 75 percent okay sorry let me just uh, do that properly okay five five b part three the alloy stainless steel is used instead of pure iron for the ball of the pen give two reasons why so we're comparing iron with stainless steel so I would say that stainless steel is hard or durable compared to iron and I would say it is also resistant to corrosion okay five part C tick one advantage and one disadvantage of recycling this type of ballpoint pen again just to emphasize if you were to tick more than one box in this column or in this column you would not get that mark clearly okay so again make sure you only do tick the one so 
an advantage of recycling that pen is that um, looking down the list absolutely it's going to conserve resources of crude oil and ores okay so it's going to help those last a little bit longer than perhaps they will the problem the disadvantage is that it's going to cost a lot to separate those materials out okay on to question six in 1912 Wegener suggested his theory of continental drift in 1912 many scientists did not accept Wegener's theory because he could not explain how it was that Pangaea this large supercontinent had split into these separate parts and he couldn't explain how the continents had actually moved apart from each other okay 6a Wegener used evidence to support his theory. Give two pieces of evidence that Wegener did use. The most obvious one to me would be the sort of way that they all fit together. I mean, how to how to word that might be a bit tricky. The fact that the the sort of oops, sort of a jigsaw fit, which might seem a bit shaky. So perhaps we're better off actually if we compare South America to Africa. The fact that we found similar fossils of organisms that lived at the same times found on on those different continents okay so i would say similar fossils in africa and south america So obviously it's playing out. How did animals leap that ocean from one side to the other? So they were found at the same time. And we've also got similar rocks. In Africa. And South America. Okay. So I guess these would be the two best marks to go for. I mean, if you can word that a bit better than me, I, you'd still get the mark for, for suggesting that, but it's how to actually word it without uh, talking too much waffle, I guess. Six part B, scientists have discovered that the Earth is made up of layers. So they've actually labeled them for you, the crust, the mantle, and the core. Complete the sentence by writing one word in each space. Scientists now accept Bregner's theory because they, they know that the Earth's something and the upper part of the mantle are cracked into tectonic plates. Part of the earth is split into tectonic plates. We've already told us about the mantle, so it's going to have to be the crust. Okay, so put that in there. The tectonic plates move at relative speeds of a few centimeters per year because of convection currents in the earth's something. Okay, so if we got these convection currents moving around, where does that happen? So clearly it's not the crust, um, it's going to be the mantle. These convection currents are driven by something released from natural radioactivity. So the radioactivity in the core produces lots and lots of heat. Okay, So just like any convection current, I guess. A volcanic eruption or an something can happen at the boundaries between tectonic plates so the an always gives you a little clue it's going to start with a with a vowel doesn't it so it's going to be earthquake okay and seven metals are extracted from their ores many copper ores contain only two percent of copper compounds copper is now extracted extracted from ores containing a low percentage of copper compounds suggests two reasons why so why do we bother extracting from those two percent copper compounds and the most obvious reason is it's it's worth your while because copper is very expensive so it's definitely worth your while doing that um, and it's also because the the copper or ores are running out or 
harder to find. Okay, so it's actually worthwhile looking for these ores with the with the very low percentages. Seven part B, chalcosite, an ore of copper, contains copper sulfide. The flow diagram shows how copper metal is extracted from chalcosite. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, by the way. But, uh, I've only ever seen it written down, but uh, I'll do my best. So we've got a fairly complicated flow diagram here where we've got chalcosite going into a crusher, lumps of the ore going into a bio leacher. We've got waste rock coming up there, copper sulfate solution feeding in this way. The powder door goes into a separator of some sort, waste rock given off copper sulfate put into a furnace at 1200 degrees waste gas given off oxygen required impure copper metal we then use electrolysis to get the pure copper metal okay so it looks fairly complicated but if you just walk your way around it, it, it you know don't be scared by it just have a have a good look and really just see what's going on before we dive into the question over the page because a lot of these questions really are common sense i think it's uh, you know, suggest one reason why it is difficult to dispose of the waste rock um, and it's simply because that waste rock is going to take up an awful lot of space okay so waste rock takes up a lot of space okay so, you, I mean, you could also say that it might contain toxic compounds, um, which are difficult to get rid of, but uh, just taking up space is simple enough. The reaction in the furnace could cause environmental pollution. Explain how. So we have a quick look back to the furnace. There's our furnace. We've got a waste gas um, being given off there, and they're asking why is, why is that an issue? Okay, the clue there being the copper sulfide that's, uh, that's actually fed in okay so what we're going to have is that the copper sulfide is going to react with oxygen and produce sulfur dioxide and I'm sure you know that sulfur dioxide will in turn causing acid rain Okay. Okay, 7B part 3. The extraction of pure copper is very expensive. Give one reason why. So we'll talk there about the, the sheer amount of energy required. Large amount of energy required to extract it. I'm thinking there particularly of electrolysis, that stage and the blast furnace because both are going to need lots of either electricity oops or or fuel to burn to get that process going okay so a large amount of energy required so 7b part 4 pure copper is produced by electrolysis of copper sulfate solution and i'm sure that's an experiment we've done which electrode do the copper ions move towards and give a reason? So it wouldn't be enough simply to say the cathode. Okay, we get a mark for that. That's the negative electrode. Oops. That's a negative electrode. Okay, you've got to get a, give a reason for that. And what you should say, and again, you could refer to the data sheet that we saw right at the beginning. Um, and that's because... Copper ions are positively charged charged um, and therefore attracted to the negative electrode. I mean simply saying they're positively charged would be enough for the mark. Okay. Seven B five large areas of land are contaminated with copper compounds phyto mining can be used to remove these copper compounds from the land what is used in phyto mining to remove copper compounds from the land and that is simply 
plants, i.e. growing plants, green plants. Final question. Crude oil is a mixture of many different chemical compounds. Fuels such as petrol, gasoline can be produced from crude oil. Fuels react with oxygen to release energy. Name the type of reaction that releases energy from a fuel. Okay, and what they're looking for there is it is exothermic. Okay, they produce energy, they're exothermic. Eight part two, fuels react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. The reaction of a fuel with oxygen can produce a different oxide of carbon. Name this different oxide of carbon and explain why it's produced. Well, the name is carbon monoxide. Okay, and that's produced because there is incomplete or partial combustion of the fuel. Okay. Eight part B. Most of the compounds in crude oil are hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons with the smallest molecules are very volatile. Okay, so there's a, a word you might want to think about. So we have crude oil going in, we have petrol coming out quite near the top, gases at the very top, and bitumen left over at the bottom or taken out that way. Okay, and obviously different fractions going to come off there. Over the page. So here's the six mark question. Okay, nothing to be scared of, but uh, you will be assessed using good English, organized information clearly, and using specialist terms where appropriate. So looking at the command words there, always a good idea using the, the sort of bus technique. We're gonna describe and explain how petrol is separated from the mixture of hydrocarbons in crude oil. Use the diagram and your knowledge to answer this question. I'd start with um, the simple statement that the process is fractional distillation. So that's what it's called overall. Just sort of setting that stall out there. This is what we're going to describe. Al always with a view to describe what's happening and then trying to explain in terms of the science you know, why that's happening just try and work our way through this so we'll start off with um, we would heat the crude oil okay and I could put a bracket there because uh, crude oil is, is a, a mixture of hydrocarbons heat that to approximately oops, 350 degrees okay so there's my first step as a result of this some of the hydrocarbons evaporate to form vapors or gases these rise up the fractionating column say they're cooling as they rise okay um, 
some of these gases, some gases will rise. Oops, will rise out of the top of the flat shaping column. when some hydrocarbons to their boiling point they will condense the condensed fraction separates from the vapors or gases from the gases and flows out through a pipe. Okay, so the process is fractional distillation. We heat the crude oil to approximately 350 degrees. Some of the hydrocarbons evaporate to form vapors or gases. These rise up the fractionating column, cooling as they rise. Some gases will rise up the top of the fractionating column. When some hydrocarbons cool to their boiling point, they condense. The condensed fraction separates from the gases and flows out through the pipe. Okay. So I think I just try and summarize this a little bit. Um, hydrocarbons that have relatively low boiling points are collected near the top of the flat shaking column and hydrocarbons with high or relatively high boiling points collected near the bottom of the flat shaking column. Apologies for my handwriting there. The, um, the way these six mark questions are answered, you, you're put into a level first. I mean, it's not like a normal question where you just tick off the points. Um, it's the quality of the answer. So to get into level three, which means you can get five or six marks out of six, the, the, the description here is, there is a reasonable explanation of how petrol or fractions are separated from crude oil using evaporating and condensing. Okay, um, level two, three, or four marks. There is some descri description of heating or evaporating crude oil 
and either fractions of different boiling points or there is an indication of a temperature difference in the column okay that would if you if you you put at that level you can either get three or four marks and for level one uh, you simply need to say there is a statement that crude oil is heated or that substances are cooled however there is little detail and any description may be confused or inaccurate okay so I'm uh, what I've put there I'm hoping I would be a level three and uh, and would come out with uh, with six marks okay so that's chemistry foundation paper that was the final question hopefully that's going to be of use to you when you're revising or when you're looking back through the mock exams to see where things didn't didn't exactly go to plan um, I will be posting a physics foundation paper shortly as well thank you